So welcome to the Inspire podcast. Um, today we have uh, Paul Donahue. Um, Paul founded his business in 1997. Uh, it's Concept Financial Services, a head office in Staffordshire, where he has 15 staff in the office and another 20 plus staff out on the road. Um, Paul has an impressive number of clients, estimated at around two and a half thousand, utilizing services for mortgage advice, uh, protection and wealth management. The business is part of the Open Work Network where Paul has grown to be an integral part of that elite team on wealth management. Paul, yep, welcome. Thank you. If you could uh, just give an, an overview of um, right from the start, sort of 1997 to, to present day, a bit of applied history of, of how you've uh, grown this business. Absolutely. So. Uh, my original history, I did five years working for Barclays Bank, where okay. I joined at 16. Uh, because of the school I was at, I thought I could go and work in the city if I was 16. I couldn't work in the city, so I did a lot of banking qualifications, got onto one of the management programmes, but at 21, realised banking wasn't really for me. I'm trying to make a few quid, just wasn't the right environment. Mm. Saw some friends I knew driving around in XR3Is, which were the cool car at the time. <laughs> yeah. I thought, I'm going to go into financial services. I went into financial services, rang up a couple of companies where typically they were conning people to join them. So they said, come and work for us. And I phoned them up and said, actually, yeah, I'd love to do this. What can I do? Um, then did that for five years with a company called General Portfolio. It was a bit of a boiler room kind of an entity. Mm. You know, they would sellotape phones to your hands to make calls if you had too many calls on a Friday. So, you know, real old school stuff. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, and then 1997, when I was 26, Allied Dunbar, as was, made me an offer to buy my practice off me to join them. And I set up Concept Financial Services at that point. Okay. Okay, so you were you were you've had that education almost in the in the front line of financial services on the phone, and, and you must have learned a lot at the at the coalface really then. Absolutely. And did that give you the skill set or confidence to go out on your own? Um, the background I'd never questioned from when I was nine years old that I wouldn't be working for myself. Right. Okay. It's just never been an issue. So even at twenty one, when. I left Barclays and my family thought, why would you leave a bank? Because that was the dream job for them. Yeah. It just wasn't even a consideration. Didn't right, even okay. cross my mind. So actually, I'm self-employed now. Yeah. I'm running the business. And then when I set up Concept in 1997, my business plan was just the voices in my head. Right, <laughs> so okay. I'll go and do this for myself and it's my own entity. Fair one. So you, so you, you backed yourself and you almost used those years, not, not so much as a, a, a career. You went in to, to probably learn certain skills that you may not have had, always knowing that you were going to go out on your own at some point. Um, I did, well, I was always, at 21, I was self-employed, even in this other company. Oh, right, okay. And I was commission only. Okay. So, right. you know. You'll back yourself with that. <laughs> yeah. You yeah. stop. And, yeah. you know, you learn tough lessons when you're commission only. There were times where I didn't get paid for four months. Mm which you really, you know, you learn how to walk and you learn what a bus is for. And yes. You have a car and you, you travel around, but that's what makes you tough. Yeah. And that's, that's what's made me tough. And I think dealing with some of the trainees and people who come through with me now, mm. and having done that the hard way in an unregulated, which became regulated, which is now a super regulated environment. Yeah. Actually, there isn't many things they will do that I haven't done, haven't seen, and haven't gone through. Yeah. So they can respect you and look up to you, and uh, I think the in terms of your uh, what you can say to your to your staff as well. And, and do, do you actually talk to do your staff know about your journey? Probably not as much as that because they probably wouldn't believe it. I wouldn't be able to yeah. relate to it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they, just, they just wouldn't have. There's a couple of my staff who would actually do that and would probably be able to go commission only and would get it, but yeah. people don't quite have the career. It's just a different environment, yeah, a different course, world. Yeah. People wouldn't think of doing that. Yeah. You know, in my past, you know, when I worked for the bank, uh, just a bit of history, I went and bought 600 ties once and sold them in the back of a pub. Right, okay. Because you used to have to wear a tie to go to a nightclub. Yeah. So I knew if I went out on a Friday and a Saturday, I'd be able to sell these ties at a fiver each. <laughs> <laughs> so it's just... That's entrepreneurship, <laughs> isn't it, right there? <laughs> yeah. Okay. And in, in terms of uh, the business in, in 1997, the product set that you that you sold, mm. has it drastically changed up until this point? Have you seen a big, big move? Fundamentally, no. Okay. And sufficiently sophistication enormously changed but essentially it's still people need life insurance yeah people need a pension people need to buy a house mm. people need to buy a business yeah that's the same the sophistication of the product and the sophistication of the advisors 
and the knowledge of the client in digitized in the digital world yeah that's what's changed and is continually changing because I guess people um, back then night night seven didn't go onto Google and do a comparison of a price it was very much it was what you were saying and what you were advising them absolutely and it, when I first started the business the internet had just come in and it was still dial up right yeah so in 1997 I remember being in my office and you plug it in and the phone had stopped working and you hear the <laughs> screeching <laughs> it's a different world to the, the world of Wi-Fi now but yeah. when I first started at Barclays faxes had just come in mm. so that was probably 1992 right okay. our first fax so you think where we are now so faxes were cutting edge technology yeah yeah, well, and it's. Um, I think the so, so the product set is is very much the same. How you sell it is is the difference. How has your business needed to uh, adapt to 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 online? How have your advisors have to ha- had to move with the times? What things have you done? We've we've followed a slightly different model. So there is there's a lot of people who are working in the online space. There's a lot of people doing auto advice or robo advice. So you go into a system and you have some chatbots, yeah, which will give you advice as to actually this is what you have. It's not actually giving advice. You know, people still need specific advice, and we're finding a lot more sophisticated people are coming to us looking for face-to-face or at least telephone conversations. Right. Okay. And that's the basis of working on recommendation basis. So it could yeah. be you're dealing with a contractor who's worked for a couple of months who might be earning 150 grand a year. Mm. Thinks I'm earning 150 grand a year. Walks into Halifax and says, "Actually, you can't have a mortgage for three years." Right. Yeah. And that's where they speak to us, and we're able to say, "Actually, this is how you do it. This is how we do a plan." And people are often decision makers, so you find decision makers like dealing with decision makers. Yeah. So how we're, we're filtering this, we make sure that we are on Facebook, we have got our online presence, we have got our online calculators. If people are very sophisticated, they won't use us anyway. Right, okay. But we work on the basis to say 70 million people in the UK, you mentioned earlier I've got two and a half thousand clients. Yes. Which I have, as a practice, we've probably got 10,000 clients. Right, okay. That's a tiny percentage of what there is in the world. Yeah, yeah. So there's a big enough market to there go is, at yeah, that you can cope is. with and grow at an organic rate, rather yeah. than you know going. And we are starting to acquire businesses. Okay, you know, we're starting to yeah. buy client banks, and clients can go for robo advice and can move on. But we're finding there's yeah. there's a real rebellion to come back. That we're finding people are happy to have face to face advice or telephone advice or just to know yeah. that there's a team in the background that can look after them. And do you? I guess what I'm thinking here is, do you do you change the way you deal depending on the age of your client with generations coming up that are probably more going online? So the older generation that want the face to face, is there a common rule with that? There is definitely. So the younger generation, they're looking for more internet. They're not that bothered about meeting you. They're still very nervous. But you know what we're dealing with is emotional stuff. Yeah. So if somebody's buying a house. Irrespective, if they're 23, it's emotional, never bought a house before, they've probably just come out of university. Yeah. They've only just started to save money, but we'll speak to the parents. Because probably 70% of our mortgages that we do for first time buyers have some sort of parental or grandparent help. Oh, do they? Right, okay. They're, they're lending yeah. money across to do it. Right, okay. So even though that we will communicate with them in a lot more electronic formats, mm. they still want to speak to people as well. Yeah, okay. Okay, so um, in terms of the the client, so in fact, if we just step back a second and look at the the three products that I mentioned at the start, which are the mortgage advice, the protection, and the wealth management, could you just give us an overview of what those three products are? So mortgages is when you buy a house, or you're doing an investment property, you're doing a commercial property. Okay. And as an entity, because we have the different schemes, so let's say if we're looking at PSR and they've got a commercial building, that would be one type of a mortgage, which we can structure through pension funds or through commercial deals to somebody who's working in PSL who comes in who's just qualified as a trainee into a full advisor yeah. and will do them their first time buying a mortgage okay. so say someone as yourself mm. who's had a house been married for a while looking for a second or third property might want to keep one of the previous properties as a buy to let so we'll show them how to do that because people often say I'd like to keep two or three properties mm. and it's helping them build the plan okay then when people are downsizing in when they're older, so people use the house as a cash point, so yeah. that's part of the retirement planning. We find a lot of people want to give wealth away to children, so if they downsize, they'll be taking some of that cash and it's getting out of their estate and that's part of the inheritance tax planning. Yeah. And I actually find a lot of people who want to downsize actually upscale on debt, because somebody might have a 400 grand four bedroom house, when they look for a bungalow in the same area, they're quite often half a million quid. 
Okay. So we yeah. have to structure and help them when they're doing that as well. So there is a, it, it's the whole generational thing, and that's when you bring the family in as well. Yeah, well, wow, because that's when you when you think about mortgage, you ask that question, you think, well, okay, it's pretty yeah, mortgage to buy a house, but there's so many different facets to that, and I guess where that's where the protection bit comes in, it is. So it's protecting, and it's helping people plan their lives. So, mm. you know, if somebody's taking a mortgage from us, they can go to anybody in the high street and get a mortgage. We yeah. actually we want to engage with them, a client when they're 23, 24, yeah, and we want to plan them right the way through till they're 70 or 80, yeah. Yeah. And then we want their 70 or 80 year old grandparents to engage with us as clients as well. So mm. it's, we're having the whole generation yeah. of their family and their friends as our clients. Yeah. Which is, you know, it's a strange business model, but it's just word of mouth and it's what's yeah. worked for us. As far as protection goes, um, tell people the truth. Mm. You know, and this might sound salesy, but if somebody, you know, example I use often is myself and my wife. So my mm. wife has been on 14 years maternity leave. Right. <laughs> <laughs> We've now got two children, both in private school. So yeah. if I were to die, the house would be paid off, so she would have a house fine. Yeah. But the house costs money to run. Yeah. The children cost money to take to school and to put in school. Mm. If I've only insured the house, I've done her no favours, I've just brought her a false sense of security. Yeah. That she thinks actually Paul's died, the house is paid for, I'm okay. She's still short of thirty, forty thousand pounds a year. Yeah. So when we're giving advice, we're giving people truthful advice and saying actually this is what you need, this is why you need it. Yeah. If people do it or don't do it, we're advising them and we're not afraid to give proper advice. And that's the thing I try and instill in the team. Yeah. We make a difference to people's lives if we do it right. Yeah. And and if you come up again the the one that market quite well at the minute that are in the press is the vitality products where yeah. they're really focused on this, you know, give you cinema tickets, mm. give you a health tracker, but it's still faceless, it's still online, isn't it? And you're pumping mm. the numbers in where you're going against that and going, actually if you want proper advice. No, we do a lot with Vitality, believe it or right, not. Okay. So they are, we find the Vitality product is really good for healthy people. Right, okay. So yeah. if you have, you know, an example. So if you're slightly, you know, as we I am, I'm not as tall as I should be for my mm. weight. Yeah, okay. <laughs> and yeah. The Vitality, I'm keen on them. Right, yeah. <laughs> I'm six foot eight, I'll be yeah. fine. <laughs> There's horses for courses then with those products. Yeah. And you tend to, so Vitality is something you need to engage with every year where you record your health, you wear okay. your watch. Yeah. And that affects your premium. So you find a lot of clients either get busier and don't engage with it as much, mm. but it works for certain criteria. So right, okay. Something like yourself, you're fit and healthy and you, it matters to you. Your vitality's mm. a challenge and would be a perfect product for you. Right, okay. I say somebody who's different, it isn't. Yeah, well, and I guess that's the, the... And that's knowing your client. And, and that's where you come in, isn't it? You can yeah. look at all those options rather than the one that markets really well and they go, actually, this one's better for you for these reasons. Yeah. Um, and it's okay. why have you got this? Why do you want this? Why do we recommend it? Yeah. The biggest thing is ask the question, why? Yeah, okay. People forget to ask this with a client. Mm. Why are you doing this? Yeah, and not actually understanding it. And I think that's a good point. Obviously, uh, advice that you give me in the past, you know, is, you know, I can back that up and evidence that, that mm-hmm. it has exactly been that. It's been a face to face service, mm-hmm. which, as the owner of the business, with X number of staff and X number of clients, still find the time to come out and, and, and meet me and my family. And that that's the reason why you continue to work with you. The convenience of it then, of, of your team and your mm-hmm. staff and knowing you, I think is why you probably get the number of referrals that you do and why that business model has been successful mm-hmm. uh, for you um, on the wealth management side yeah. could you just give the listeners a uh, an overview of what wealth management is and this this is an evolved market and this is something that has markedly changed the last few years so wealth okay. management would be if somebody's got money to invest so they've downsized the house and they've got you know fifty thousand pounds twenty thousand pounds a million pounds mm. we will invest that in a various different structures for them okay it could be their retirement planning. So somebody has pension plans. A huge issue, or not an issue, but a huge part of our business is pension consolidation, which is when somebody, and you find people who've worked in PSR, might have three or four employers. They might have three or four small little pension schemes. Mm. PSR have a new pension scheme. We'll advise them to consolidate these schemes into one so it's something they can use going forward. Okay. From our point of view, wealth management is a real driver of value in the business. Mm. We currently manage about 100 million quid 100 million pounds worth of client okay. funds, right. which we get paid for for doing it. So yes. we'll get paid a percentage of the funds. Clients don't have to pay that, so mm. we have to make them returns. Right, okay. And yeah. that's so wealth. And that it is a, yeah. so different. It stands to doing a small pension scheme for somebody to making sure somebody doesn't have an inheritance tax bill. Yeah. Two clients have had who've sold businesses for several million pounds, and we restructure we investments 
and income for them depending on what their circumstances are. Right, okay, okay. And, and in terms of the three products that you've got then, what percentage of your business now mm-hmm. is made up with the well side opposed to 10 years ago? Is that changed in terms of the percentage of business that you're looking or, or driving it's towards? It's changed because the business has changed. Actually, as okay. initial revenue, we're mm-hmm. still pretty much third, third, third. So third oh, right, on okay. protection, third on mortgages, third on wealth management. Right, okay. As a value in the business, the wealth management is more valuable because if somebody was to buy us, yes. they've got a, a, a bed of income that they know they're actually getting straight away. Okay. But we tend to find we're, we're a holistic practice, mm. and it's really as a holistic means that we will cover all three, and we have experts in all three. So my yeah. admin team, so there's twelve people in our admin team, yeah. of which ten are qualified advisors. Right. Okay. Which means if a client rings up and they want to discuss a mortgage, they'll speak to somebody who will know them know they're working with me and know that they, they'll be able to be advised on a mortgage. If somebody wants a review on the portfolio, they can't get hold of me because you can't speak to everybody all the time. Of course, yeah. But they'll actually have a professional account manager who'll say, actually, mm. how are you doing, Dave? Actually, this is how your scheme yeah. is. We'll send it over and you know where you are. Yeah, okay. And you, and you mentioned earlier about um, you acquiring businesses, you acquiring mm. practices. Are you aggressively acquiring at the minute or does it have to be the right fit for you? It has to be the right fit for us and it's something that could grow. Mm. We've changed massively as a business. As you know, we've gone from being a fairly small practice mm. five years ago, which was really about you know the ego of Paul Donoghue to yeah. <laughs> things need to grow with the wealth management side just to make sure that when there are more clients that it can't be all about me so it's trying to make sure that the team work like me yes. there's a the average age of financial advisor now is 57 really it's right about, okay and that's the average age yeah. realistically it's older okay there's been a real dearth of people coming into the industry so we've mm. got a graduate training program which we've currently got 10 graduates on okay yeah it takes them two years to qualify as an advisor probably four years to understand being an advisor right okay and these maturing advisors want to sell their practices, so we're able to buy them. Yeah. They pay for themselves within five years, so we'll pay them an X multiple. Yes. We'll typically fund it over five years, mm. but it's client acquisition. It's trying to then get the client to work with how we like to work, mm. and it's trying to make sure that we've got the new generation of advisors coming through in the practice. Great. Okay. And in that graduate program, then, because this is very interesting, is that are you working with a certain university to get to get to get the graduates? Probably, or? Graduate program is probably how I'm selling it. It's okay. not necessarily graduates. Right, so, okay. You know, we're quite happy. We'll take people who... People have to have a good ability to learn. Yes. But that doesn't necessarily mean you've been to university. Okay, so it doesn't exclude people that are non-university Absolutely graduates. Not. So it's how okay. they come across, their ability to learn, their ability and how they communicate with people. So we have quite a few graduates, so six of the ten. Yeah. There's one lady who's just joined who's got some really good A-levels. She did a year of university and the particular course she was doing was going to take her into the police force and the police force scrapped that department. Right, okay. So she worked for another firm for a few years. She's come to work for us and she's bright, perfectly yeah. capable, able to do it. So it's aptitude and ability. Yeah, okay. And yeah. that's... Education doesn't necessarily make you a good advisor. You still need to be able to speak to people. Yeah. Okay, and that's great because this is leading on to some of some of the stuff I wanted to go through in terms of your your, your culture and your hiring strategy. So, um, what we'll do as well on the show notes is we will put a link if it's okay with you to if people want to get involved in this graduate program next time round and how they can get in touch with you and, and potentially put themselves forward for it. Well, in terms of your your culture as a business, yeah. you talk about moulding people to be sort of mini used, and then you can go and grow the business that way. Yeah. How would you describe the culture? Um, the culture is all based around service, and that the clients it matters to the client. Okay, and if it matters to the client, it should matter to us. Right. Okay. Yeah. And we've learned this as we've gone through periods of time where if somebody's buying a house, it's emotional. Yeah. If somebody passes away. They need. They will nearly always call us. Often before they'll call the bank yeah, and just right. say, "Actually, am I okay? Yeah. Are we okay as a family?" And it matters to us that we get back to these people and say, "Has my money? Is it making money? Mm. You know, if there's a wobble in the market, which there is, so we yeah. don't always make people money. People need to have the confidence and the ability to know actually it's safe. It's a long-term plan. It's part of what we've covered. You are safe. Okay." So the culture for me is the clients mean everything to us. Yeah, okay, and that, that comes across. And I think, so we're we saying it's that expert knowledge mm-hmm. uh, of, of, of advice that, that you've clearly got to have, the, the buying into the customer, getting close to the customer, knowing the customer and having high levels of emotional intelligence to deal with 
uh, certain situations that can be very sensitive. Well, it's, you know, I, I always joke, when I was in my 20s and 30s, I got invited to lots and lots of weddings. Mm. And a lot of the clients, because they just took it as red, I was one of their best friends. Right, okay. No, I wasn't, but I've been through them through so many yeah. seminal parts of their lives. Yeah. Been with them before they got together, when they bought the first house, when they had their kids. Yeah. And that's, so, you know, clients ring up and they are all friends. Yeah. And they become friends. You know about what their dreams are, you know about what their health is, you know yeah. what their family's doing, you know the dynamics going on in the family. Mm. And this is why I have a real issue with some big businesses that lose sight of that. So yeah. if you have a bank advisor, will change every six months and you're going through that, are you really going to trust somebody? No. For me, no. actually, I know the inter- you know your family, I mm. know the intimacies of all your family. Yeah. Not I can tell you. <laughs> <laughs> but it's you have to respect that yeah it's a really important and that's bring that culture through the business and if i find people don't respect that i really have an issue with that in the company Mm. and it's uh, is it tough to instill that culture in your uh, advisors that are out on the road potentially don't come into the office uh, on a daily basis how do you do you bring them together a a quarter a monthly how do you how do you get the message out depending on the advice so we've so we we have a a recruitment manager who's a sales manager we have a compliance manager and we have an operations director so these guys speak to the advisors regularly okay. we have quarterly meetings and we have two half yearly get togethers as well yeah okay. and the two half yearly get togethers really are about meeting up having some fun having a meal and having a drink right, okay. <laughs> it's quite a few guys who don't, yeah. but that tends to loosen people up and give them a view actually they are part of something what are mm. they part of what's the ethos and they're chatting to each other and I know a lot of the advisors speak to each other right okay but we are a very tightly regulated business. Yeah. So we pro- we check at least 25% of the business, their process. And is this the F- um, FCA part in terms of how it's regulated or is this internally Both. regulated? So the FCA okay. have certain guidelines for us, but we check it as well. Okay. And then there'll be secondary checks through Open Work you mentioned earlier. Yes. Who are regulated by the FCA, but we do it as a practice. Right, okay. And it's to follow, make sure we're looking after the clients, make sure we're compliant. Mm. make sure we're doing the right thing and make sure there's no cowboys so it's a high performance culture really throughout the whole thing from your sales staff to how you deliver it operationally yeah, it is. and everyone in between um, and, and in terms of because it's great you sitting here and, 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 and saying this how do you gather the feedback from your clients through evidencing a couple of ways we do so we do we still use treated customers fairly which was an FCA scheme that came okay. out three yeah. or four years ago and that's how we do questionnaires to our clients and people we've done post work. Okay. We do do an element of telephone calling, which we'll use an independent company who will phone up probably one in six, one in seven, just okay. to see. And there's a double sword to that. Is one, are you happy with how the advisor was? Mm. And two, did they follow the process of the legalities because it's so tightly regulated? Yeah, okay. And then, you know, I will actually ask clients. So a few years ago, we had, we'd got very busy, we'd grown, and I rang quite a few of my very close clients and said, right, give me a, an honest appraisal of how we're dealing with things. Yeah. And some of them gave me very frank and honest feedback where we'd slipped. Right. So okay. that changed and that's something we now check regularly. Okay. And you know, not asking the same people. We will ask the same people, but it's actually mm. asked the question. Yeah. And I really encourage my clients, especially because they we are classed as friends. Yeah. Tell us the truth. If you're not happy, tell me. Tell because if you don't ask, people then probably don't feel compelled to tell you and they yeah. just leave your business where what you'd rather do is ask the question, gather the feedback and do something about that's it to make it better. And our client retention is massive. Yeah. You know, and yeah. sometimes it shouldn't have been as good as it is, but clients have a loyalty to it. But we, you know, we're, we're in the high 90% for client retention. Oh, yeah, right. yeah, okay, which is why you're growing, you yeah. know, ultimately. Um, and in terms of you, um, you spoke uh, about um, people coming in and you grant programme. Yeah. What skills do you look like, look at when you're hiring somebody? Is it, you mentioned education, yeah. they've got to be willing to learn, but not necessarily have an academic background. What are those key attributes that you look for a good IQ okay yeah we don't want people who are stupid because they yeah. need to be able to pass exams yeah more importantly a good EQ right, so somebody okay. needs to be able to hold a conversation yeah there's no point having somebody with a PhD who actually can't look you in the face yeah. and can't carry something <laughs> yeah um, so yeah and discipline you know yeah, so I'm a large chap but I, I train quite a lot yeah I want somebody who who carries himself correctly. Yeah. Somebody okay. walks into a room, there's a way that people walk into a room and that's yeah. and that's part of the EQ and it's it's how you buy it. Are they gonna hold a room? Yeah. 
that it, so it's the whole package of how things come across um, we do have an interest so our recruitment director we actually call him the S-Bend because he gets all the smells away before I meet them there's other words we use in the office <laughs> so, so we have the yeah. filtration system before okay. it comes to me anyways so, yeah. and those guys know exactly what I want Okay, but I still get the sign off on anybody that we do recruit. You do, right? Yeah. Okay, and do, do you get involved in the training aspect of them as well to develop them and and model <laughs> yeah, them? I do. So, yeah. and again, we've just evolved this recently. So, staff and advisors will sit with me and watch me at appointments. So this okay. afternoon, I've, I've got some advisors sitting with me in the meetings. Okay, um, but we do use external training through Open Work. So the graduates mm. have to do. There's about eight exams that they have to do. So it's a HNC level or HND level qualification and they can then go into chartered status yeah. but this will be through open work so typically they'll do two or three days at a residential course a month Yeah, we actually allow them an hour studying every day as well towards right exams. okay yeah so over and above lunches all the staff have it and then we have sales training with them as well and what I'm trying to encourage them so we have typically three intakes a year which will be groups of three and we'll we encourage them to really buddy up and be competitive with each other mm. so part of the competitive environment part of actually what you're going to do yeah. and they can practice how they communicate to each other okay. in terms of technology to to drive that competition there's lots of products out there and one that uh, one that we use is, is a recruitment product called cube 19 which drives that um that competitive edge within sales staff but there are other products out there um that, that offer that from a technology point obviously you can use spreadsheets and tv yeah. but there's a lot of tech out there that does that as well yeah. to, to enhance that culture um if you could uh, just finishing up on the business before we look at um advice and, and you personally what is your vision for the business how big do you want to get you know what can you give us a feel for that it's the balance so again the business model has changed enormously in the last three years okay um and really it's because it's driven by the failure of banks to give advice to the mass market right, okay you know there's a lot of staff who are now members of pension schemes where they're having eight percent going to a pension so people are going to be driving up bigger pension pots than yes. they had before mm. people are buying houses and really people you know i deal with some very wealthy guys i've got some wealthy friends but realistically the model is people up to three million right okay but starting at a thousand pounds yeah because you know acorns become trees um so I'm seeing us in the next few years. We want to, the target is for the end of next year, we're at 32 advisors now. Right, okay. With anyone qualified. So yeah. we should be at 50 by the end of next year. Right, okay. Which is a kind of ceiling that we need to be on, otherwise we're looking at other offices. Yes. But in the next seven years, to have a billion pounds under management. Right, okay. Billion pounds. And yeah. uh, what was the number you're at now? Under 100 management? Million. 100 million, yeah. okay. So, you, so we could do that. Yeah. With organic growth. And we're doing about 100 million pounds a year worth of borrowing yeah which should be a quarter of a million okay. to 250 million That'd a be year. a nice retirement nest egg for you to uh, I'm go skiing you. a bit more often yeah <laughs> I'm doing four this year oh, right. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah okay but no you you obviously got that that vision and it's great to um, we, we haven't speaking to quite a few business owners on this podcast and and when you then go out and speak to clients within your own business some things that come back is that some businesses don't get the message out overly well to their staff where with yourself I think your passion and your vision comes through and the staff will buy into it mm. and you're going to get more loyalty from them they're less likely to leave the business aren't yeah they? I hope so I mean, again we don't lose many staff yeah which shows because they're it? all on training programmes I don't know but yeah. it's, 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 it's been a year's yeah. time yes yeah. <laughs> yeah. okay um, and just so the, the current market um, what's your what's your view on the, the sort of economic backdrop of the, the UK at the minute <laughs> Do I have a view? <laughs> <laughs> yes, that should have been a bit more pointy question. Um, yeah, I think our economic fundamentals are very, very strong. Okay. Yeah, you know, contrary to whatever Sky News and BBC says. Yes. A lot of businesses are now sitting on a lot of cash. Okay. Or have very low gearing where their debt levels just are, are very, very serviceable. Yeah. And I think there's a massive underinvestment, which I think when Brexit's sorted, whichever way it's sorted, mm. will start to take root. Okay. I think there's a, a level of underemployment in the country where people haven't been taking people onto training programmes. Mm. So whatever happens next year, I think there'll be a boom. Right, okay. I just absolutely do. I think you look at construction, which I know you guys are working in. Yeah. You know, there's been a lot of commercial demand, less residential demand, but then there's a lot of domestic demand that's pent up where domestic, you try and get an extension done, you can't get a builder to do it because they're making yeah. so much money building houses. Yeah. 
think engineering we're very specialist so I think our service industries and our banking industries are very very strong and robust mm. so I'm just not a doom and gloom merchant no. I just think there's so much pent up spending to be done I think we're, we're fine for the next okay, few okay. years yeah well, that's really great and that should give people real confidence um, moving into next year and I think we're only at the, the start of the, the digital revolution really aren't yeah, we, we are. it's going to it's going to speed up pretty quick over the next 10 years and you know we'll, we'll probably wonder why we had a, a microphone like this uh, you know in 10 years time but um, okay are, are there um, are there any government backed um, finance schemes ISAs or anything like like that that you could just give the listeners maybe a, if there's one scheme out there you know go and research this are there anything out there at the minute that's topical well there's, it, well, there's not just one there's a, a few a pension scheme is fundamentally the most tax efficient because you get a, a tax relief at your whatever your relevant rate is yeah 20 40 45 percent ISAs are just tax efficient I know they've just scrapped the help to buy ISA but you've got the the lifetime ISA which is yes. still available um, and then for people saving, you've got things like VCTs and EISs, which are higher risk investments. So mm. VCT gives you 30% tax relief on an investment. Right, okay. It's very good because it invests typically into companies that are after their third stage of funding. So they've done it themselves, okay. so they've done their friends and family, and now they're ready to go again to the next level. Right, okay. And VCT companies, and it's a government scheme to help these companies become the unicorns of the future. Okay. And for me, I really like investing in those kind of schemes personally I like clients doing it it is a more sophisticated way of doing it but you feel actually there's a benefit and this is yeah. what's really growing the country yeah okay that's really interesting and um, you talk about um, you talk about investment mm -hmm. and uh, you've been involved I know in terms of a lot of uh, investment people will come to you with pitching for advice mm -hmm. what if you could give the listeners one piece of advice if they were going out looking for funding what would that be <laughs> It's a trade. I wouldn't even be looking for funding. The biggest thing is to back themselves, right? Okay, and to pay for it themselves. Yeah, I have a lot of people who will come to me and say, I want to set this business up, and say, Okay, but what are you doing? Well, I don't want to give my income up. Yeah, well, I don't want to put my house on the risk yeah. on the line. Yeah, actually, if you're if you're prepared to back yourself, then back yourself. Yeah. I'm not yes. suggesting you'd be stupid, mm. and it might stop some entrepreneurs in their 30s and 40s, but this is why entrepreneurs often go bankrupt and make it back again in a couple of years. Yeah. You know, have, have a bit of courage and be prepared mm. to back yourself before. If you're not prepared to back yourself, why should somebody else put a hand in the pocket? Yeah, of course. And I think that's probably where, from the skills you, you learn, so mm. yourself, you talked about when you were in your early 20s and you were you hadn't earned for four months. You, yeah. were, you were backing yourself really, weren't you? And so you had skin in the game. You were like, well, I'm commission only. Mm. Well, I can't afford to put petrol in the car. I'm going to have to, you know, get bus or whatever. You know, you find a way. Yeah. You find a way and you learn a lot about yourself. Uh, during that, that time but I think any business is commission only and this is the thing that people yeah. forget you think it's commission only because I happen to be selling life insurance and pensions yeah. if I was selling ties if I didn't sell the ties I didn't make commission yes yeah of course you know PSR doesn't place anybody it doesn't make any money so everybody's yes. commission only it's just people have a connotation in the head as what they really are yeah, yeah agreed agreed um, okay and if we can just go on to um some personal stuff uh, about yourself mm -hmm. uh, to give people an idea of your maybe a bit about your educational background mm -hmm. where you um, you know at school were you like I'm going in you've already talked about you wanted to be an entrepreneur you mm -hmm. were going to work for yourself did you uh, at school think it was going to be in the finance world and just give us an idea of what your educational background was so educationally uh, you know I was good in school bright yeah. went to a school where it didn't take a lot to shine yeah. <laughs> in the kind of background I was at <laughs> um, it was just very very easy school was for me but then okay. at 16 it was also very easy for me to leave right okay so I did yeah. my O levels I was last year of O levels which shows my age um, I thought actually I can. I want to work in the city because there was a program at the time called Capital City, and it was all the yuppies. And I thought, right, I can see a bit of that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'll go work for a bank, so I did a job with the bank. Yeah. Found out actually when you're a cashier, you don't get to work in the city. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> did the qualifications and worked on from there. Yeah. Um, so educationally, I left school very ordinary. I got into mm -hmm. levels, very ordinary background. But then I did some ACIB, which is Chartered Institutes of Banking Qualifications, which yeah. I had some distinctions in because I was motivated when I first started. Mm. Got into a development programme with Barclays. Didn't follow it through because I didn't see a benefit in carrying it through because I knew I'd be leaving the bank. Yeah, okay. Um, 
financial services. When I started that, the actual qualification course was two weeks, right, okay. which was about 10 days longer than it was a year beforehand. Yeah, okay. <laughs> now, it's a, as I say, it's a two year process and there's a yeah. lot of qualifications which I've studied and I continually study. Yeah. You know, uh, professional development, I do at least 80 hours a year. Do you, right, yeah. okay. And that's, okay. you need to invest in yourself, you need yeah. to, and this is the thing I try and instill in the team, you need to know what's going on to be able to discuss it with people. Yeah, of course. And of course, you, yeah, you've got you've got to be knowledgeable, and I guess as as things change, things update, you, you've got to be at the forefront of that for a minute. You just need to know, and you know, I have a, an element of educational envy as well, which drives me on where I look at people who have degrees or people who know things, and yeah. because I've perceived in my own head as part of my own guilt, I haven't got that. It's why mm. I study a lot, and I still continue to read. You know, voracious reader of things like The Economist. Yeah. Because I want to know what's going on. Yeah. Okay. And did you, or, or do you, have a, a mentor in, in in your life? I haven't. The mentor's been the, you know, the voices in my head. Is it right? Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, what I do like to do is I do find a lot of people I deal with are very motivational. Yeah. So, okay. And you tend to find that people. It's quite funny actually, it has, as time's evolved, a lot of my friends are nearly all in business. Yeah, okay. Um, really good friend of mine that we both started in the bank together at 16, sold for 25 million a couple of years ago. Right, okay. We were both 16 year old bank clerks. Yeah. So you tend to find the mentors tend to be my friends. Uh, okay. And it's okay. just the people that you mix with. I do meet inspirational people. There was a, when I bought one of the businesses I'm involved in, a chap called Roger Gabb, you know, he's just a very decent, motivational man he happens to be a mm. hundred million pound as well right, yeah. but self-made ex-SAS very yeah. decent chap so I take inspiration from people like that and, yeah, okay. and I really take inspiration from how they are with people mm. I tend to find the, the successful people I like are very very decent and have a good moral compass Yeah, really matters to me and that's um, I'm very interested in, in, in do a lot of development work myself in terms of listening to other podcasts and, and getting into the routines and habits of, of highly efficient successful mm. people is there any um, common trait in successful people that you go that a lot of them do that uh, in terms of a routine or a habit I think successful people are all a little bit strange right okay to a man or a woman they're yeah. a little bit weird or quirky yeah and that's because they just won't they will do what they want to do yeah, right, okay. they don't tend to bend so there's a there's a drive behind them and that could be are they very very strict in their disciplines in mm. how they eat how they exercise how they work, whether it's family, there's always something that's quirky, but you'll find that successful people just have a drive or an ability to do something that less successful people won't push yeah. themselves to. Yeah. They don't make excuses. Yeah, okay. So and it's that that self discipline, isn't it, to find what works for them and yeah. continue to do it over and over again while others will do it for a week and give up. They, they won't let themselves off the hook. Yeah. That's yeah. it, you know, who are they responsible to? Mm. They're responsible to themselves. Yeah. And, and can you talk to us about your uh, routine? You, you, you mentioned that you, that you work out, um, mm. you're busy. Yeah. So how do, you, how do you fit that in? And do you have a daily routine? Yeah, so a daily routine, um, when I work, I'm working. When I'm home, I'm home. So my family's mm. is my weekends. I'll do the odd rugby match or the odd football match, but it's typically I'll try and be with the family because I don't see them during the week. Yeah. During the week, I usually get up between half four and five, which I said the wife thinks I'm an insomnia, but yeah. do my emails, get myself ready, and then a personal trainer comes around the house at six o'clock. Okay. The reason the PT comes around, because I could train myself, is because it's in the diary and because somebody's coming around, I'm definitely going to train. Yeah. So I train at least four, normally five times a week. Right, okay. Finish at seven, get the kids up. Kids are then, I like to have breakfast with them and that's part of our morning. Mm. They then go to school at eight o'clock and I go to work. And I'll then work through till about eight o'clock. Right. Okay. Most days. So it's a it's a it's a long day, but you still find and and this is the the important, but you're still finding time for yourself in terms of investing yourself mm. physically from a health point of view, and also you talk about the eighty hours plus of learning you do in the year that you're finding time to do, and you know uh, uh, having known you, and one of the interesting things sometimes I think is when you say, well, I'm actually need to do something today, so I'm going to actually hire a driver so I can do something on the hop so I can mm. do more to, so you're finding ways to develop yourself and develop your business by just thinking outside of the box yeah and you know I think that's a testament to you in terms of how you do that and, and you find time you know clearly a, a, a busy guy um, 
in terms of <clears throat> um, but you, you read a lot of books what's the um, one business book if you were to gift a book to somebody and say read this what would that be actually it wouldn't be a book I'd give them a subscription to The Economist right okay and let them read that every week okay and it's a weekly um, weekly, weekly. Um, it comes by a magazine but I read mine on my iPad yeah okay and it's a brilliant way of not knowing what's going on in the world right okay you know what's going on with companies with countries with business with politics for me it's just a really good insightful read yeah okay and uh, last last question young uh, aspiring people in the world we talked about um, you know we've talked about education and we've talked about you developing your business as a you know 16 to 18 year old there in the world what what bit of advice would you give them decide who they are going to be okay but it's so easy to watch TV programs and see, right, if I go on TV, I can become a star, and that's the easy way of doing it. Yeah. It's somebody else's fault why I can't do something. Mm. The biggest thing is just decide and commit. Yeah. Whatever you commit to. If you're doing A-levels, finish your A-levels. Yes. Yeah. If you're then going to meet people, meet people with you know a good handshake, with a straight back, yeah. with a good positivity, and communicate to yourself correctly and get your physiology right, that will carry through in what you're going to do. Yeah. I say to my kids, it's you know a bit crass, but head up, shoulders back, boobs out, male yes. or female. If you walk into something right, you're feeling better, you're able to do things better. Yeah. No, that's that's great advice. And I think what's come out of this uh, podcast today and something that, that I often refer to is you you're the sum of the five people that you spend most time with and who you choose to spend time with. And Paul clearly spent a lot of time with successful people with good habits good morals and then you become a sum of that and you and you better yourself so i hope uh, the podcast has been uh, has, has been good insightful and inspired people the whole point of the podcast is to meet with business leaders gurus who have been successful and, and try and bring out some of their habits um, and, and advice so we want to inspire ordinary people to do extraordinary things and i think paul is a, is a living example somebody that's come out of education um, system had a clear focus on what he wanted to do to work for himself and is doing it very successfully um, creating lots of jobs graduate programs invested in his staff as well as himself and overall giving a great service to to his clients so Paul thanks a lot for your time thank you and uh, all the best in the billion pound uh, wealth management portfolio in a few years time good man thank Cheers, you thanks thanks